Hi, everyone, and welcome to the session Wake Up Call, Navigating New Pathways for Corporate Community Investment in Canada at the Empower 2021 Conference. I'm Bruce McDonald, President and CEO of Imagine Canada, and I'm just delighted that you're taking the time to find a little, a little bit more about the report that uh, we produced in late 2020 that really talks about Corporate Canada's response during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, before we get going, I really want to thank the RBC Foundation, our national partner on this project, and our knowledge partner, Blackbaud. Um, the support from both of these uh, organizations has enabled us to do this important research and be able to provide this information to you. Um, about Imagine Canada itself, if you're not familiar with our organization, uh, we work to, to bolster charities, nonprofits, and social entrepreneurs to build uh, a rich and define our nation and the communities that they support. Uh, you know, essentially what we seek to do is we work to improve the operating environment in which social good takes place so that if organizations have more success in their communities, we've done our job well. And we do that primarily through public policy advocacy at a federal government level, through the provision of research data, information and knowledge. We certify charities in a standards program so that they demonstrate the highest levels of good governance, transparency, and accountability. And we seek to engage with Canadians to have them think more deeply about social good in their communities. Very timely, given what's going on in Canada and around the world right now. So today, uh, really just uh, the agenda is uh, about the key highlights from the study. And then hopefully uh, it'll stimulate questions and discussion uh, amongst your organizations. So this report, uh, the, the wake up call report was formally released towards the end of November in 2020. You can see this is where you can download the report. It is a free report, um, so there's no fee for it uh, and be able to take a look at the, the full details because we're only going to be able to provide the top line uh, data and information for you today. Just to give you a sense of the methodology and how this was created. Um, we did uh, extensive one-on-one -on -one interviews with community investment, sponsorship, partnership executives. So those people working in the field from some, uh, more than 20 of Canada's largest companies. We did a focus group with eight companies. We had done a, pro a town hall uh, with about 50 companies. And we also looked at uh, and conducted primary research on the impact of the recession on charities and, and reviewed uh, over 50 studies on the impact of the pandemic on charity, society, and corporate giving and partnerships to be able to provide kind of a snapshot as to what's happening inside Corporate Canada. Um, through that work, we identified 10 trends that emerged. Um, at, it, it, these came out in varying degrees and in varying ways, but there was enough thematic groupings to be able to say, uh, these are categories that are similar. In today's presentation, we're gonna focus on a number of them. The, the sort of the, uh, this idea of the uneven pandemic and inequalities that we found, a time for racial justice, the great cataclysm, uh, what's happening with our sector during that time, unrestricted funding, kind of an interesting pattern that we saw emerge. The fact that companies really stepped up, this idea of the CEO as social advocate, partnering from impact, for impact rather, which has been a long-term trend, and COVID-19 and climate change. So we're gonna take some time and explore each of these, but as I said, there is uh, more in depth in the full report itself. So, you know, this pandemic has been the biggest challenge in the modern history of the charitable sector. And it's created this, this, this sort of perfect storm whereby revenues have plummeted, charities have switched programming online, and demand has soared. So as we think about our sector, uh, this is a challenging equation. On one hand, more and more Canadians are coming to charities, nonprofits, and social entrepreneurs seeking support and seeking services so that they can, you know, basically weather the storm that is the pandemic. So demand has, ri has risen. At the same time, though, revenues have plummeted. In some other research that Imagine Canada had produced, and again, out in late uh, 2020, we found that 68% of organizations had indicated that their, their fundraising and their revenues had dropped since the start of the pandemic. Um, certain areas have been really challenged, whether it's event-based fundraising, door-to-day -door or canvassing, um, and in the earned income space, that has gone down dramatically as well. So overall, 
organizations are dealing with this paradox, this tension, rising demand for services, decreasing revenues with which to be able to deliver those services. So some of the highlights from the study based on kind of that environment in which organizations are working. One is that we're seeing that social inequalities are being exacerbated. So this idea of an uneven pandemic, it's not affecting everyone the same. You know, if we look at employment, um, hours worked have fully recovered for high wage workers, but remain down 20% for low wage workers. Education, um, seeing no reduction in progress from high income areas while low income areas saw, you know, 50% reductions in progress. Mental health stress for people in society, self-reported rates of depression and anxiety have skyrocketed you know, while service providers were deluged with inquiries. And here's an example of a 350% increase in contacts at Kids Health Phone. And food insecurity, rates of food insecurity increased by at least 40% as numerous families went hungry. You know, and one of the things that we've, we've also seen is that families who never thought they would be in the situation of needing to rely on services from charities and nonprofits have found themselves doing so because their employment has been affected and now they're actually going to food banks where they never thought they would be. And so uh, we are also seeing within this though, within this increase in demand, that certain parts of society are being affected more than others. And it's generally skewing towards those that are at a lower income level. At the same time, those who are providing the services are, are in crisis. So I mentioned earlier, revenue streams across the board have been hit. And in fact, one of the things that we've noticed that's different from this crisis, from the 2008-2009 economic crisis, the worldwide economic crisis, was that at that time, many sector leaders reported their ability to transition either industry type for support or type of revenue generation stream. And what I mean by that was that if they were seeing real stress uh, or disruption in their revenues from support that they would traditionally have gotten from the financial services sector, they were able to say, well, let's go to talk to oil and gas or let's go talk to the insurance industry. Uh, similarly, if they found that event sponsorship was down, well, we would just go and not do another special event, but maybe we'd launch another type of fundraising campaign. The difference that we're seeing in this pandemic is that all industries, all revenue streams are being affected. There's really no place to turn. And so you can see, again, that comparison about average change in revenue. And don't forget, this is average across the entire sector. So some are being affected way more, is down 31%. At the end of the day, it was only down 1% in the 2008-2009 recession, so a 30-point difference. And that's not to be underestimated at the same time that organizations are seeking to provide additional services to meet the increased demand. So the implications of that devastation, staff have been laid off. The good news is that the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy Program has allowed lots of those to be recalled, but we have seen that uh, uh, staff numbers are down. Programs are shuttered and I would say now we would add into this that not our not just our programs shuttered but permanent closures are starting we're starting to get word of organizations who are saying we won't be back when the pandemic is is finished um, widespread virtual delivery one of the good things that we've seen in inside of this is the ability of the sector to innovate quickly and move their uh, delivery of programs into a virtual or digital space in a way that they haven't done before. Um, and that as we look at the usual sort of uh, jobs reports that come out, nonprofits are among the slowest to rehire. In part, we think that it's because many organizations entered the pandemic in a less than strong financial position. Many didn't have cash reserves, or if they did, they were very small. So they're not able to draw on a strong financial base to bring some of those staff back and are just having to let those programs not happen and those staff not be recalled. Um, companies have stepped up, and I think that's been some great news that we've seen. Uh, but they, for them, the future is uncertain. From a, a, a Charity Aid Foundation survey of companies uh, that was done 
we saw 72% of funders indicated that their funding envelope had increased in the last three months versus the previous year. And certainly in Canada, we're seeing many companies who have stepped up to say, we'll continue to do what we've done in the past. And in addition, we're going to create specific COVID-19 type funds or support programs. Uh, at the same time, though, we're wondering, what will that mean for the future? And you can see some of the quotes from the corporate leaders on the screen. Um, I suspect our ability to give donations is going to be limited probably into 2023. And I think one of the things that we're watching very carefully is the correlation between the recovery of the Canadian economy and therefore the profit-making ability of the private sector and how does that affect their corporate community investment or corporate social responsibility budgets. Um, so it may be that, yes, they've stepped up early in the pandemic, but Quite frankly, we're running a marathon, and the question will be, um, are these additional funding streams more like a sprinter or middle distance pace because we're going to need that kind of support in the long term? But the good news is Corporate Canada has stepped up. And again, some other uh, sort, of, sort of quotes again from the survey, uh, but one of the things that we've seen is a, a, an area of emphasis and focus, not just in Canada, but around the globe, on anti-black racism powered by Black Lives Matter. And I think a greater awareness and um, examination of anti-racism and anti-oppression activities and, and systemic racism in our society. And so you can see quotes from uh, leaders of a, of a black focused community health organization um, that yes, it's a, it, there's money which is great and essential, but also wanting to have a longer term relationship. And one of the things we've talked with companies about is that uh, hopefully these kinds of introductions and conversations and support will be a combination of both funds, but uh, talent and expertise that organizations can leverage. Um, one of this other, the other trends that we found was this trend towards unrestricted funding. And uh, I think for those of us who have worked in the sector for a long time, it's a very hopeful type trend. Uh, in the sense that over the last 20 or 30 years, more and more funders, that includes the corporate community, have been restricting or targeting their dollars. You can only spend the dollars on a specific program or a specific initiative and not be, have been able to take some of those dollars and support the overall health and well-being of the organization. And I think one of the things that you're seeing um, uh, out of some, some work from peak grant making and a survey that was done in the U.S. Uh, is that there may be an appetite or an opening to talk about changing that practice post pandemic. And the one area that's highlighted here is around the, the idea of, of converting existing project grants to operating grants. And you can see that 53 percent of respondents anticipate keeping changes post COVID. And I think for those, again, for those of us who've worked in the sector for a long time, that's a, a really help, hopeful sign. And hopefully it's one that we can have conversations with funders of all stripes, be they corporations, government foundations, or individuals, and say that as we think about the health and well-being of organizations, it's not just the programs that need to be funded, but it needs to be, which might be expressed through the branches of a tree, but we need to ensure that the roots and the trunk are strong so that they can weather these storms and that those programmatic branches don't break off. If we have a strong core, a strong organization, we'll be able to bend in the wind, but not snap off. And I think that's what we see through uh, this unrestricted funding. So I'll be curious to see how that uh, continues in the future. Um, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, last spring, we saw this um, explosion of awareness around systemic racism in our society. I thought this was a, an incredible statistic. The first six months of 2020 had US corporate funders pledge nearly 18 times more funding to issues around racial equality than in the previous decade combined. That should be combined. And uh, that's an extraordinary statistic. Um, I think it's extraordinarily in, in two ways. One is um, how that support hasn't been there, but also the pace with which that change is happening. And it's interesting because um, as you examine that a little bit deeper, um, that there's been sort of emerging challenges in, in funding BIPOC-led organizations um, in the sense that leadership of, of the not-for-profit sector itself is not necessarily reflective 
of the population serve and tend to be older, whiter, and more English speaking than the population of Canada as a whole. And that nonprofits that received corporate funding tend to be larger and national, while those focused on racial equity tend to be smaller, local, and grassroots. And you can even see that some studies in the US have highlighted these challenges in the sense that they found that for organizations focusing on employing, improving life outcomes of black men, revenue in organizations with black leadership was 45% lower than those with white leadership. And unrestricted assets of organizations led by people of color were 76% smaller than those um, led by white leaders. And so a time of change is taking place. I personally, as someone who's worked in this sector for a long time, believe that the transformation that's going on as it relates to our sector's examination of systemic racism and the way that we will change and uh, operate differently. This is not a kind of flavor of the month examination. This is a long-term systemic change that I hope we will go through as organizations together. I thought this was, this was an interesting quote that came out of, of, of some of the research. After the summer of guns in the early 2000s, the Youth Challenge Fund came up with a lot of investment in the community, especially around black youth. About 150 plus organizations and groups were funded in the amount of about 40 something million dollars. Of those, only maybe three still exist. And so I think what the difference, I'm hopeful that the difference is that the, the kind of investment that's coming this way, the kind of change around how funds are, are um, provided will be long-term, will be about the way that uh, community investment is done in the future. Um, I, I thought this was also a really interesting trend around the CEO as social advocate. And uh, this, uh, this finding comes from the Edelman Trust Barometer, which was released just actually prior to the pandemic. So it was speaking to trends that were happening before COVID-19, which I would hazard a guess, and I'm very curious to see their next phase of this, uh, were those accelerated during the pandemic. And it's interesting to see that more employees are having expectations around how their corporate CEO acts as a social advocate. And I thought one of the most, and this is just my own reflection, that one of the more interesting findings here was that the types of topics that they're expecting their CEOs to talk about and have opinions about are shifting. Yes, there's the what I would call the traditional, which might be that top layer of training for new jobs in the future, ethical use of technology, automation's impact on jobs, the kinds of things that you could see corporate CEOs being very comfortable in talking about. But now we're seeing this introduction of income inequality, diversity, climate change, and immigration, the kinds of things that might be not the usual, but more out of the comfort zone of many companies. And I'm hopeful that this will be a continuation, because if you think about our work in the, in the uh, charitable and nonprofit sector, having allies from the corporate community also acting as advocates, not just funders or investors, but also using the strength of their voice to lend weight and support to powerful issues in our society could be a, a welcome addition to the kind of work that we do, not just in the programmatic space, but acting as advocates on behalf of the people that we serve. And so I'm hopeful that we'll see this one continue to grow. You know, one of the trends that's been there for a long time is around partnering for impact. And this is work that I know that Imagine Canada and others have been involved with. I, I know that Imagine Canada have been back as far as 2008 doing research on it. And it continues. Um, companies we spoke to thought the pandemic would quicken this trend of stronger, deeper partnerships, but that new practices uh, were needed. And I think one of the things we're seeing is, is a widening of appreciation that it's going to require true, deep, and meaningful partnerships to really make a dent in societal issues or challenges. Um, again, one of the things in terms of talking about this whole area is around small organizations and BIPOC-led organizations. They've traditionally received a small fraction of corporate funding. And I think one of the rallying cries, one of the things, the invitations to corporate leaders who review this report is that they shouldn't shy away from local, smaller community partnerships. Um, that if they really want to engage in this space of, 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 of racial equity and justice, that they're going to need to do that. Because right now, the mosaic 
is comprised more of smaller community-based organizations rather than large national organizations. And that might mean a, a change of practice at the corporate community. Also, this idea of, of a need for long-term collaborative partnerships. You cannot change a systematic problem by just funding a one year project or a two year project. I think for those who work in the charitable and not for profit sector, we're probably applauding uh, this kind of thinking because I know that uh, having multi-year agreements has been something that many people have, have been hoping for and working on for years. It's wonderful to see that there's a recognition amongst corporate funders that their participation and their desire to see real change would in fact be supported by staying power and being able to support those organizations over a longer period of time. And again, this is where some of the trends start to intersect a little bit. Deeper partnerships and unrestricted funding. The pandemic has just pushed changes in funding relationships faster and companies have had to react in the right way and do the right thing. And I don't want to belabor the point, but I think this is an important one. I think there's an opportunity here to um, affect the way funding unfolds in the longer term. I do expect that there will be a, a recalculation back to project and program funding, but maybe through this experience in the pandemic, it won't go all the way back. And we can ensure that funders are being more open and more mindful to funding the roots and the trunk to ensure that there's strong organizational health and well-being. And a great example is our ability and our capacity to adapt to a, a virtual and digital world. And while we've seen many organizations do that really well, others have been stuck. They've had you know, decades where they haven't been able to invest in both the technology and the people understand how to use that technology well because those kinds of dollars have fallen into cost of administration. And hopefully what we're seeing from the funding community is that we need it more now than ever before. And that will be part of a response going forward. COVID-19 and climate change. This is a, another trend that surfaced um, in terms of also thinking about the intersection between issues. You know, this, this quote from Bill Gates, COVID-19 is awful. Climate change could be worse. If you want to understand the kind of damage that climate change will inflict, look at COVID-19 and spread the pain over, out over a much longer period of time. The loss of life and economic misery caused by this pandemic are on par with what will happen regularly if we do not eliminate the world's carbon emissions. And so there's examples there of, of what's been happening as it relates to climate change. But it was interesting, I think we found in our research, that um, even though we entered the conversations to talk about what was happening from a pandemic perspective, what we were hearing reflected back to us was also a linking to other cause areas. And in this case, the, the, the major one that, uh, that surfaced was around climate change. And so I think going forward, again, uh, organizations will be looking at the intersectionality between the kinds of causes. And again, some, some, some other quotes to support that. To build healthier communities, we need stronger partnerships. We need new ways of operating. We need resilient organizations. The pandemic is one threat and multiplier, but there have been and will be others, whether they be natural disasters, climate change, or global unrest. And now is a great op window of opportunity to change how we operate and how we collaborate. If we don't, the loss of faith in our companies, our society, and our institutions will only grow. If we do, we unlock new solutions, new opportunities, and innovate in ways that will shape our country and our communities uh, for decades. So again, these are the, the 10 trends that we found. This idea of the uneven pandemic and inequalities exacerbated by COVID-19, a time for racial justice, and this, the, the, the profound changes that are happening there. Um, the impact, the great cataclysm on the sector. One that we didn't spend time on today, but this constant pivot or adaptation and that uh, we are in fact seeing innovation inside the not-for-profit sector. Unrestricted funding, building on what's worked, the fact that companies have stepped up and we are so fortunate in Canada to live in such a generous nation. And again, another one we didn't spend time on today, but engaging virtual employees and there's both new challenges and new opportunities. This idea of the CEO social advocate, increasing expectations on corporate Canada to be partners publicly in championing causes and mission areas. 
Partnering for impact, this long-standing trend, the fact, the recognition that some of these problems, these societal issues are simply too big to tackle on their own as corporations. We need deep, meaningful, long-term partnerships to affect social change and COVID-19 and climate change and learning from the pandemic and this intersectionality of causes. So uh, in terms of next step, um, Imagine Canada is going to be moving forward on taking a look at one or two of these trends and going deeper. Um, is there a way that we can learn even more um, and, and create recommendations for companies and nonprofits based on the implications? Again, as I mentioned at the outset, this is a free report. Uh, at imaginecanada.ca and you can just uh, find and download the report, um, get a chance to go through it. And we'd love to hear from you in terms of, you know, what resonated with you or what in additional information uh, would be helpful. Um, in in follow-up, any questions can come to myself or Steve Ayer, who is actually the author of this report, someone we've worked with for a long time at Imagine Canada, and be, feel free to reach out to uh, either or both of us with your questions or comments. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, once again, thank you to our partners, our national partner, the RBC Foundation, our knowledge partner, uh, Blackbaud. Without their support, we would not have been able to undertake this important work. And with that, I want to thank you again for taking the time to, to spend virtually <laughs> with me today to hear a little bit more about this report, and hopefully we can build together off these findings to have a greater um, connection point between corporate Canada, charities, nonprofits, and social entrepreneurs to ensure that the kinds of communities that corporations and their employees want to raise their kids, support their aging parents, be healthy and happy individuals, align with the work of charities, nonprofits, and social entrepreneurs. Thanks very much.